colonization. What image comes to mind when you hear that word? Possibly a white man planting a flag in an already inhabited land, complete with swords and disproportionately large hats. And you'd be right. Colonization is the action of settling and establishing control over indigenous people. Add the prefix D, however, and the meaning becomes much broader. Decolonization. Of course, it refers to the physical removal of colonial powers, but in education, it involves rethinking and reframing the outlooks through which we learn. Within the context of this talk, we'll be referring primarily to the impact colonization has had on people of color. But it's important to note that all marginalized groups are in some way affected by colonialism. This relates to any form of education which we're exposed to, be that the books we read, the museums we visit, or the shows we watch. They're all impacted in some way by colonization through the voices they highlight and the stories they tell, and thus need to be decolonized. However, one of the key points of focus when it comes to decolonization is what is being formally taught in schools. By decolonizing the curriculum, we're able to create an education system that is truly diverse and representative of all experiences. I'll give you an example. Let's have a quick show of hands if you vaguely remember learning about Pythagoras' theorem and the Greek philosopher who invented it. A lot of us. Now, keep your hand up if you also learned that the Babylonians understood and used that same theorem a thousand years prior. <laughs> Significantly fewer. And why is that? It's because the current education system is set up in a way that we see things through a Eurocentric lens. It prioritizes the contributions of people of color at the expense of everyone else. There's countless other examples of this. The world's first university, historically renowned navigators, fundamental scientific discoveries. But they all follow the same trend, disregarding the input of people of color. That's not to say we should suddenly discredit the work of individuals such as Pythagoras, as many of these discoveries are made independently but we should equally revere all those who play a hand in developing such ideas. If we're only taught about the achievements and perspectives of a small group of people, we're missing out on a wealth of knowledge, which not only limits our understanding of the world, but also reinforces inequality and marginalization. Now, that all sounds well and good in theory, but how do we actually go about decolonizing the curriculum? There's three key steps to making this a reality. Number one, Acknowledgement. We have to acknowledge the history upon which our current reality is built. For us in the UK, that means acknowledging the impact the British Empire has had on our current society. That includes having open discussions about the impact of older events, such as the Bengal famine of 1943, where three million Indians died of malnutrition. And more recent events, such as the Windrush scandal in 2017, regarding the wrongful deportation of black British citizens. By acknowledging and accepting that events such as these did take place, and that they did have an impact on British history, we take the first step towards having a fully decolonized curriculum. Step number two is action. This is to do with all the structures we put in place to decolonize the curriculum. It isn't as simple as just reading a few Maya Angelou poems during Black History Month. We have to fully incorporate the work and ideas of people of color into each aspect of the curriculum by rethinking the very foundations of our education system to a point where it doesn't feel performative but provides a beneficial insight. For example, at Nottingham Girls High School, we've refined the English curriculum to provide students with a more representative approach to the literature they study. We've replaced controversial books by white male authors, such as Of Mice and Men and The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, with pieces of literature that celebrate a diverse array of authors and themes, such as The Bone Sparrow and The Alchemist. We've also changed the language we use when teaching. Instead of referring to specific poems as poetry from other cultures, the module has been renamed to Powerful Voices, so as to avoid othering certain cultures and students and to eventually break down the Eurocentric view on literature. However, 
change needs to be made on a wider national scale to provide students across the country with a more rounded view of the society we live in. When we learn about British history, we'd also learn about the realities of people living under the British Empire. Instead of just the European languages, there'd be the option to learn Mandarin, Arabic and Hindi. Every subject has the capacity to change. And the final step is to adapt. The whole point of decolonizing the curriculum is to make the outlooks and experiences we study more universal. And naturally, these change with time. Every shift in the political climate, every development on the global stage affects individuals differently, be that due to their sexuality, gender, race, religion, or economic background. And it's essential that we're willing to reflect these changes within the curriculum. There's a famous quote by George Santayana, which I imagine many of you will know. Me quoting a white European man is in a way ironic. I struggled to find an equally popular and relevant quote by, for example, a woman of color, showing how our views on history are dominated by a specific demographic of people. Anyway, it's those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I'll leave you now with just one thing to think about. Whose perspectives on the past have we remembered? And whose have we allowed ourselves to forget? Thank you. <laughs>